Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Aperio microconference. Um, today, we're going to be speaking with Ben Cott on uh, co-op petition and uh, open source projects working together. I think this particular topic is highly relevant to uh, the um, Aperio community specifically. Um, and uh, considering the, the organization and the multiple projects we have. Uh, Ben's project, or uh, sorry, Ben's presentation is uh, one of uh, uh, several that we've done over the last two years, um, starting way back in, when the board was doing some strategic planning, and we invited a few folks to come in and talk to the board about um, considerations impacting educational technology, open source and education, and so on. Uh, we have more upcoming micro-conferences uh, ahead of us, so take a look at the schedule here, and hopefully you'll keep an eye out for notices from us about these upcoming events. Um, and please feel free to share with other folks. Um, as a reminder, um, we are posting these on YouTube. So if you just search for uh, a pair of microconferences, you'll see them. And, we, and again, the, the topics have really been um, pretty broad, um, everything from policy and regulation to best practices and open source uh, community development. Um, and governance and so on like that, uh, and other related to project management and development. Um, so we hope that uh, you'll find all of the previous uh, uh, microconferences of interest and hopefully join us from others and share with folks. So as I was saying, I think this topic is is really appropriate for a pair. I just looked before, uh, late, earlier this week, setting up for this, and we have 52 uh, groups that are involved um, with Aperio. And some of the Aperio projects have multiple groups. CAS and Sakai and Uportal are definitely uh, probably the biggest uh, communities of uh, uh, in Aperio. And even those groups are are divided up into you know, end users and, and campus administrators and developers and faculty and instructional designers. So we have sort of the ed tech community, the open source community and the higher education communities and different folks working in all of those. Um, and I think the topic of how do we work across communities and not just practitioners, but even the projects, how can the U portal community work with the Sakai community, work with the CAS community and so on. Um, and each, even calling someone a developer, are they a developer from the community? Are they a developer on a campus? Are they a developer from a commercial affiliate? We have so many different personas and person types and professions working on these projects, coordinating all these folks and different interests and different areas and, and different drivers is really a challenge for all of you. And I see the majority of the folks on the, uh, with us today are from community management roles um, within the projects. So I think that's testament to uh, the interest in the uh, within the projects and the need to, to foster collaboration and participation across projects and across communities. Um, I'm really excited about the topics. I've sort of done a little pre-read on some of Ben's um, um, work. And we share a culture of collaboration in higher ed and open source. There's that sort of same openness and sharing and transparency around research and teaching and open source communities. Um, there's similar issues uh, across all these contributed turnover and whether that's a campus or a program that's been developed um, at a university or an open source project. Um, how do you onboard and, and engage? How do you engage your students? How do you engage your community members and, and developers? So a lot of similar themes that I think are going to uh, pull uh, all of the projects together and hopefully give us some good insights on moving forward um, as projects. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Ben, Ben Cotton. I, I think we met when I was at the OSI just through maybe initially email and then bumping into each other at conferences. But Ben is a longtime uh, member of uh, the open source community. Fedora, I think maybe the you're most known for is your work in the Fedora community, but there's been others. Um, he's been involved in community development and community management efforts. Um, a real wealth of experience across not only the technical side of open source software development, um, but the community development and management side, two parts there, development and management, which I think is key. So I'm really excited to uh, welcome Ben and uh, hear a little bit more about co-opetition. Um, and uh, thank you for being here, Ben. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna hand the presenter over to you.
right. That looks like my slides. Excellent. Um, so thank you, Patrick, and the whole community for having me here. I'm really excited to talk about this. Uh, I don't think there's anything in this presentation that's like particularly novel, but it's not something that we explicitly think about in open source communities very often. And it's, you know, how do different projects work together? Um, so I, I always like to start talks off with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns, uh, the usual disclaimer supply. I'm going to be talking a lot about the Fedora project because uh, that's where I have a lot of experience, particularly on this particular subject. Um, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the Fedora project or any current, previous, past, future employers. Um, this talk content is under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 share alike license. Um, and the photos in there under the Unsplash license, which has a very almost unrestricted usage. Um, there will be a QR code at the end. These slides are already on the Internet Archive, so you can take them and do whatever you'd like with them. Um, if you have kind things to say, love to hear that. Always enjoy the feedback. Uh, my Mastodon handle is the primary place. I'll have some more contact information at the end. Um, and of course, as always, you are cordially invited to keep the unkind things to yourself. Um, who am I? Well, Patrick covered most of this. Um, like I said, a lot of this comes from my experience in the Fedora project. I was the Fedora program manager for five years. I led the documentation team. I'm a packager. I was magazine editor, had a lot of different roles in the community. And so I've contributed to Fedora, to HT Condor, which is based out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, it's a high throughput grid computing scheduler and resource manager, lots of others. I've done a ton of writing, um, probably more than I ought to, um, including a shameless plug real quick for my book. Um, I won't use this as a sale pit, sales pitch, uh, but I did arrange with my publisher that if you use uh, the promo code APERIO2024, you'll get 30% off the ebook when you buy directly from the publisher. The QR code is there. You can find it later. I'm not going to go on about it, but I just want you to have that, um, and I'll include that link at the end as well. All right, so let's get down to business. Um, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about why projects cooperate, and like even when they're competing, like, we don't want that, right? Um, and then how to cooperate and what to look out for. Um, I left hopefully plenty of time for questions and answers and discussion. You know, I was talking to Patrick about what we wanted to do for this talk. You know, we really, we both agreed like, let's have people here. Like, let's talk about the real world issues that your projects are facing um, and how to address those. So there should be plenty of time after the slides. Um, if you have questions, drop them into the chat. If it's not something where I like, I know I'm going to get to that, I might stop and answer it, or we might keep it to the end, um, we'll keep you in suspense that way. All right, so this may feel like an obvious question, but why do projects collaborate? And the most often, the most common reason is they have a relationship. Um, one of them may be downstream of the other project. They may be in the same ecosystem. Um, you know, they may be solving adjacent problems. And so like, it makes sense that you want to have some interoperability or something like that. Uh, I think probably the, the best example is desktop environment projects and Linux distributions. Lots of Linux distributions primarily ship with either the GNOME or the KDE Plasma desktop environment. The desktop environment, like most users aren't going to um, you know, grab their own desktop environment and install it and all that. Like, this is going to take whatever the Linux distribution they're using ships. So the desktop environments need the Linux distributions to get into the hands of users. And the Linux distributions need a desktop environment so that when somebody installs their distro, they have, like, the things you expect on a desktop computer, not just, here, here's the command line, have fun. They also cooperate to keep upstream, upstream sustainable. So this is like a related reason, right? There's a relationship here. Um, but you know, if, you, if your project really depends on a project upstream in order to keep going, you wanna make sure that upstream project is gonna keep going. So you might spend some time uh, contributing to that upstream with helping with testing, bug fixing, things like that. Um, you know, being a flywheel in the community. Um, 
that sort of thing makes sure that the project you depend on continues to exist. That's very important if you want to keep using it. And then there's economies of scale. Um, you know, if you're just running everything on GitHub, it's free. You don't really need a lot of stuff, but look, what if you want to add in mailing lists or discussion forums or web servers or all of these other things, you know, a chat platform, and these things cost time and money to run. And you could devote your project resources to doing that, or you could partner up with some other projects and like, Hey, let's share this server that we all use. And then it's a little cheaper for each of us. And honestly, like open source is lonely. Um, about half of people, I think, in a recent high lift survey talked about open source being lonely. There was a 2014 study, so it's you know a little dated, but probably still generally true that 95% of non-fork GitHub projects have three or fewer maintainers. So that's not a lot of people to work with. And you know, when you're putting volunteer effort into this project and people are placing demands on you and it's kind of starts to feel like an unpaid job, it's just it's not fun if you're all by yourself. And then of course projects cooperate accidentally. Um, because people are people and you know you may not realize that you're collaborating with another project, but you know, you've got what you've got contributors in common because people are using different software, so they might contribute to their desktop environment and their email client and this fun game that they like to play. Or they might be working for a company that has to support several different Linux distributions, and so they're contributing uh, you know, to each of those Linux distributions. But ultimately, like that's how open source works, right? Like, of course, projects cooperate with each other because people cooperate in the project. Like that's the whole benefit of open source software. And yes, you know, strictly speaking, you can build your software, you know, behind a curtain, throw it over the wall. As long as it's under an OSI approved license, it is open source. But realistically, we have expectations around community norms of cooperation, collaboration, um, open development. And so when people talk about open source, they're really talking about more than the license. They're talking about those that community culture. But even when they're competing, like, you know, don't you want to try and beat the other project that's doing the same thing as you? Like, why, why would you co cooperate with your competition? Yes, even when you're competing. Now, why is that? Well, Open source company projects aren't companies. You know, we're not out to, you know, dominate the market and become the monopoly player and take everyone's money. I, there are probably some people that want to do that, but with open source software. But as a rule, it's a different ethos. There's different motivations. And honestly, companies that compete actually co cooperate anyway. Like there's a famous story of Microsoft giving Apple a bunch of money to get um, Microsoft Office working on Mac because they recognize, hey, as long as Apple's in business, we have a little bit of a defense against monopoly. Um, it happens all the time. You know, companies come together and have trade associations where they, you know, all the m mobile phone carriers, for example, come together, work to lobby legislators to pass certain laws or you know, promote certain things like, um, you know, Agriculture industries will promote beef eating or, you know, corn or whatever. And um, even I think it was last week I was virtually attending the FOSS backstage conference in Berlin. And one of the keynote speakers was talking about incident response at a bank where, you know, there was a bank that was in the middle of an active cyber attack. And so they called up one of their you know, their competition and said, hey, what firewall rules are you using? Like, help us out. And they did because, you know, that was good for the whole ecosystem to not have this bank be offline. So coopetition is a thing that happens all the time, even in the, you know, cutthroat business world. And working together can increase the market. Um, 
And again, like, you know, most open source projects aren't really thinking about like trying to bring revenue in. But if you're thinking about like wanting to get into the hands of more users, I think I, I saw that for the first time, Linux desktop usage has reached 4% of total desktop usage. And, you know, the joke is like, it's the year of Linux on the desktop. And that's been the joke for 20 years. Um, 4% is a very small market. So, you know, Fedora and Debian and Ubuntu and OpenSUSE can, you know, fight each other to try and grab a piece of that 4%, or they can work together to grow the total to 10%. And then even if the proportion stays the same, like everyone wins. Um, and so that's another really good reason that competing open source projects can uh, cooperate because they're, you know, the, the enemy isn't the other project, it's the proprietary software. Um, you can also improve your commodity layers. So like, if you're both using, say, the LLVM compiler, nobody's going to pick uh, you know, their email client based on the compile flags you use or whatever. Like, that's not a differentiating feature, right? So if you fix a bug in the compiler that you're using and the other web browser or mail client or whatever also uses that compiler yeah sure they get the benefits but it's not like it's differentiating anything so you know you've made your life better it's okay if you've made other people's lives better too um, it's also a great way to share needed skills um, you may have heard of this thing called uh, the secure supply chain um, turns out that's a thing people are really care about these days and when i say people uh, I largely mean like governments um, and large companies. For better or for worse, that has resulted in a lot of, you know, what I would consider unfunded mandates placed on small open source projects. Like you need to improve your supply chain security so we can take your software, incorporate it in our proprietary product and keep our customers safe. Not a super compelling argument. But, you know, I think we can all agree that secure software is better for the user than insecure software. But does your project have that skill necessary? Could you maybe share with your competition to, you know, have somebody with some security expertise or help with marketing or graphic design, translations? Um, like translations, I think, is like the primary example um, because I know quite a few translators don't actually really know the software they're translating for because they don't need to. It's, you know, you get the basic context and you translate the string from one language to the other. You don't need to know like the incredible technical details you need to know of the languages. So I know people who translate for six or seven projects because, hey, they still know the same language no matter what software that they're translating for. And, you know, let's be honest, how are you going to stop people from contributing to your project and also your competition. Like, you're not going to have them sign a non-compete. Like, people won't even sign contributor agreements, um, which again, like the, whether or not they should is, is a separate talk. Uh, but there's really no way to stop it. Like you have no, like unless you're going to kick people out of your project for contributing to other open source projects, um, which is probably a good recipe for you to not have an open source project anymore. Nobody will want to be with you because that's kind of a jerk move. Okay, so we understand now how and or why projects should collaborate with their competition, you know, why they should uh, cooperate, um, why they should uh, compete and work together at the same time. How do they do that? Well, the first question or the first step is to like, understand what you want to get out of it. Um, you know, if you've seen the classic 1960s Disney movie, The Parent Trap, um, you can't just walk in like with Haley Mills and her guitar singing, let's get together, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great start, but like, you gotta, you, you gotta be more intentional about it. Um, quick talk, throwback to the book. A lot of, and if you've read like any of my blog posts or anything, I'm really big on like the intentionality of it. Do good things, but understand why you're doing it. You know, have a, 
a reason for it. So what is it that you want to get out of it? Do you want to, um, you know, get skills that you don't have in your own project? Do you want to increase the total uh, contributor base? Do you want to make sure that your upstreams um, are more reliable, more stable? Do you want to work on a shared testing infrastructure? Figure that part out. So yeah, once you know what you want to do with it, you look for the specific areas. Um, common upstreams is a great way to do it. Um, you know, you're both using the same compiler, you're both using the same Python library. Hey, let's work together and help each other out getting these fixes or features added. Um, you could borrow tooling. So, you know, maybe you've built an awesome build system in your competing project. They say, oh, you're using that cool build system. Let's go and in install it here. Um, you know, Fedora did a very similar thing with the OpenQA um, that OpenSUSE runs. Like, hey, this is a great QA system. Let's run it ourselves and then work together on improving it. Um, you know, I talked about shared infrastructure. So, hey, let's stand up a discourse server and, you know, we'll have a category for our project and a category for your project and, you know, everyone works together. Or you know, maybe you'll have um, shared login infrastructure or shared Git server, you know, whatever. The area, you know, these are certain areas that are, really make a lot of sense. So once you've identified like how, like on an ongoing basis, what do you do? Um, I put talk to each other in here. It's like, this is kind of obvious, right? Like you can't cooperate or co op I don't know, um, if you're not communicating to each other. But I think it's really important that it not just happens at the level of I'm a contributor to project A and also project B. So like I have the context between the two projects. Um, I think like the project leadership level needs to be in regular contact with their um, you know, partner projects on how, like what they're working on. Um, you know, sharing ideas, plans, goals, anti-goals. One of the things that I've not actually seen in practice, it may be in practice, um, but I think it's a really good idea is to have an ambassador. So let's say, hey, my job is to represent project A to project B. I show up at their meetings. I, you know, provide project A's opinion about certain things. I go back to project A and say, hey, here's what project B is working on. Um, you know, here's areas I think we can cooperate. Uh, it's kind of one of those problems where if it's nobody's job or if it's everybody's job, it's nobody's job, right? So if you have somebody who is like, hey, you're the one responsible for keeping in touch with this other project and representing us. Sure, somebody else can step in. People, you know, more than just that one person can do it. But then there's somebody who has, you know, ownership of that responsibility. And, you know, I think a really important thing that I touched on a moment ago was sharing ideas early. Don't come up with like a fully fledged plan, you know, six month roadmap of how you're going to implement everything and then go to the other project and say, hey, uh, we're going to do this. Do you want to come along? Because there are probably things in there that they're like, no, that's not that's not helpful or that's counter to our goals. Um, you know, open source is kind of messy. Sometimes you put ideas out there in the early stages people to debate them, they discuss them. Usually the ideas get better. And if you want to bring an entirely separate project along for the ride, then they need to be able to buy in early on and provide that input. Another great way is that like, conferences and events make fertile ground for um, working together with other projects. So you can co-host events like maybe you've got like a regional meetup and, you know, project A and project B are both making, um, you know, French toast simulators. It's a fun game. You want to make French toast. I don't know. Um, you can have a French toast simulation meetup where you can talk about both projects. You can work together, but you're sharing the logistics. You are expanding the audience because now both project A and project B's audience hear about it and that makes, you know, if they tell friends and like you're expanding the network of people who can show up, it makes it a lot easier. Um, if you're not doing you know, events like that, you can sponsor and attend each other's conferences. Um, 
you know, Fedora and OpenSUSE work very closely together. They sponsor each other's conferences. I think they actually I think the money actually does change hands. Like here, here's some money, and then a little bit later it's like, all right, here's some money, and it's the same money, just kind of bouncing back and forth. Uh, my sisters and I used to do that for our birthdays until we decided it was silly. Um, and, you know, OpenSUSE is famous for bringing their beer to conferences. And so, you know, we always enjoy that. Um, but, you know, that's a great way to be immersed in what the other project is doing and, you know, pick up on passive things. And one of the great things about conferences, um, whether virtual or in person, is that you have this opportunity for serendipity that you wouldn't necessarily get in the day to day. Um, and when you're talking about projects, you know, looking for ideas to work together, that's a really great source. Um, if you're at third party conferences, you can visit each other's booths or even share a booth if you know you have to pay for it. Um, one time I was at the Southern California Linux Expo, I ended up spending an hour and a half talking to the people in the OpenSUSE booth with my Fedora shirt on and somebody came and slapped a, you know, chameleon on my arm and we, you know, joked and post, post pictures on social media. But I was just talking to them about like, hey, here's some of the challenges that I'm seeing, you know, trying to address in the Fedora community. How are you doing it? And we kind of learned that nobody had good answers for the things we were seeing, but we were both seeing it. And so just that much was very validating. Um, you know, ultimately open source is people and you know making these connection kinds of connections is really important to get projects to cooperate but it's not all sunshine and daisies like cool you know i talked about relationships all relationships of any kind will have challenges sometimes sometimes the relationship doesn't you know need to continue or there are things you need to do to get it back on the right track to make it mutually acceptable so you want to look out for things like, are you getting what you wanted? If you remember a few slides ago, we talked about like, have an idea of why you're trying to do this. Um, and then, you know, six months or a year down the line and on a regular basis, like, hey, is this still doing what we want? If the answer is no, then is it doing another thing that we didn't even know we wanted, but we like? If that's still a no, then, you know, maybe it's time to move on your separate ways. And that's fine. Like people come and go from open source projects. Open source projects can come and go for each other. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, but if you're putting effort into it, you know, open source con contribution time is limited. You got to put it the effort into places where it matters. Another thing you can look out for is should you join forces? Like if it turns out that you've got two projects that are relatively similar and they share like 95% of the code base or whatever, I could they just combine into one project with like two different offerings? Like, you know, imagine if Fedora Workstation and Fedora KDE Plasma and Fedora XFCE and like all of these other, um, you know, desktop spins or like the design lab, you have all these little variants Imagine if they were all their own separate project, that would be ridiculous. Like the amount of extra overhead that would, you know, running dozens of build farms that do the exact same thing and have a package set that differs by, you know, 20 packages out of a thousand or something. That's not useful. You can, so you can combine into like a larger umbrella project um, that either like, you know, has two versions of the same thing or maybe say, you know what, we're just going to merge these two code bases and have one unified thing that looks a little bit different than the two that exists. Or it could be, we're going to keep these as two separate projects, but like under an umbrella project that provides some common infrastructure and stuff. All of these are valid outcomes and, you know, potentially are like desired outcomes in a lot of cases, if you're talking about saving volunteer effort and reducing, um, you know, the duplication that can, uh, come of that. Another thing to look out for is, is everyone leaving? Like now that you're working closely with this other project, is everyone contributing over there and not to your project? Um, that's a bad thing, but maybe not because the other project is stealing your contributors. Maybe it's because the other project is doing something that makes it more attractive to contribute on over there. 
whether that's like the community norms or the technology or whatever. Um, so if everyone is leaving for the partner, the project you're cooperating with, um, that's probably a chance for introspection for you to see, all right, what is it that we're not doing that we could be doing, or what is it that we're doing that's driving people away? Um, it's not an opportunity to go blame uh, another pro the other project. Uh, and so that is the end of the prepared content. Um, like I said, the slides are um, on the Internet Archive. That QR code goes to the Internet Archive link. Um, I put my Mastodon and LinkedIn URLs there. Uh, I've got a couple of blogs that I write on. And then, again, if you uh, wanted to order a book for 35% off the retail price, there's the code. Um, we have plenty of time left, so if you want to come on camera and ask a question, love to have you do that. If you want to just put it in chat, that's also fine. Um, you know, not everyone's comfortable being on camera, especially for something that's going to live in posterity, or at least as long as Google lives. So, <laughs> uh, thanks, Ben. Um, yes, and if uh, folks have uh, questions, I think Lisa has one. Uh, Please talk a little bit how to organize or structure collaborations. Yeah, so I think it, um, you know, kind of depends on what kind of collaboration you're wanting to do. Uh, I'm a big fan of like writing down, all right, what are we, like, who are we co um, collaborating with and why? What kind of goals do we want? Um, and then like, who's going to sort of lead the effort? So let's say um, you're collaborating on um, building out, you know, automated test infrastructure. You write that down, you probably want, if you have, you know, somebody on your QA team or, you know, whoever does QA for you now, like they lead that, you, they go talk to the, the other projects, QA people, um, and you figure out, all right, how does this work? Um, you get, you know, the implementation details and you sort of like let your QA team you know, own that within the project's organizational structure. Um, if you don't have a QA team, then maybe you're not ready to like collaborate on standing up an automated test infrastructure. Maybe it's more like you go to this other project and say, hey, we'd love to like chip in how we can with this, so, like, you know, help writing some test cases or something. Can we borrow a portion of your, your test infrastructure? Um, you know, open source projects tend to be very uh, duocracy. So if you're the one doing the work, then, you know, you have a lot of autonomy within sort of the general framework set by the project leadership. Um, and so I think that's the best way to approach it um, in terms of like, you know, you don't want to have like a three page document that somebody needs to fill out if they want to collaborate with another project. Um, but you do maybe want to say, hey, just write down, you know, in our wiki or, you know, in a ticket through the you know, technical steering committee or, you know, however your project organizes things, write down a record of what we're doing with whom, who's leading it on our side, what we want to achieve. Um, because people come and go in open source projects all the time. Um, and retaining institutional knowledge can be really hard. So yeah, it has to be written down somewhere. Um, does that address your, your question sufficiently? I'm, I'm looking at the chat as if I'm making <laughs> eye contact with you. I'm sorry. Um, um, I have maybe just a follow up from as you were speaking. So how do you how do you avoid the perception of just being a taker? So I have a project, I have a need, and now I'm going to go out and find someone who's doing that or is, is doing that well, and I want you to help me. I want to take what you're doing. I assume that the best collaborations, the best cooperation, and when, the, when both sides get something out of the relationship. So how do you identify your needs, but at the same time identify what you can offer so that there's you know, we all get the just streams of, 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 you know, whether they're tickets or their discussion forum questions or their, you know, wherever your plat, whatever your platform is, 
how do you filter the what are some ideas about filtering that in order to find potential partners um and how do you promote yourself as someone who can contribute back to the folks that you're that you're talking with so um you know i think one thing is like if you are just going to be a taker I'd be upfront about that um that's not necessarily a bad thing um open source has a lot of people who take you know upstream code and use it whether for their own open source project or you know a hobby or you know commercial use um like there there's not we should be very careful about making everything transactional because that takes um a lot of the the community out of it right uh but also you know i think it is you know you do want to come and say hey i'll trade you you know you know this skill or this ability for that um i think the best way to do is first like start out like what is our project good at um you know do you have a couple of really awesome designers that contribute to your project um, or a couple of really awesome documentation writers you know, open source projects almost universally um, while they you know could always use more help across the board um, you know documentation and visual design are two areas that very few open source projects have um, enough time uh, enough people working on um, so you know figure out like what are you good at and um, you know, basically come up with like, all right, here are the things um, I advise spending some time, you know, when you when you're joining an open source community as a, a con contributor just on your own, you know, some of the best advice is to not do anything yet. Like join the community, watch the mailing lists or the discussion forums or whatever, get a sense of the culture, see what, um, you know, what, how people interact, where the state of things, um, uh, v. Ambrosur, who's speaking next month, uh, has a lot about that in uh, her book of the same title, uh, Forge Your Future with Open Source Projects. So I'm not going to go into great de detail with that. I think it's the same thing when you're looking for how can my project cooperate with another project. Um, you know, if you like, have some projects in mind where you look for something like, OK, well, we share a lot of the common technology, so we probably have a lot of overlap in contributors already. Let me just go spend a couple weeks subscribe to their mailing list and see what they what they're talking about and then approach and say hey we need this thing we can offer this thing can we work together um, and the answer might be no and then you know you move on to somebody else um, you know I, I also you know in that kind of case where you know that you have contributors in common go to them like hey what do you see that our project could offer this other project that you're already in or you know what could we get from that project that we need for ours um, you know those are the pe people who are already active contributors in both projects um, will have usually very good answers for you on that um, because they already know they're you know choosing to be in both of those communities so you know they could leave at any time so uh, they clearly have um, you know, some stake in it and they want to see both succeed. Sorry about that. Um, I was just looking at Wes's, uh, question there. I don't know if you saw it. Um, I did. Um, so I'll read it out for the video. Uh, first robotics has a term, uh, cooperation coined by Woody flowers. It's really similar to your co-op co and first actually encourages the use of open source as a way to raise the community. Are you familiar with first? It's actually a really good application of your concepts of why groups cooperate even when you're helping your opponent. Uh, yeah, actually, um, my daughter and my stepson uh, both have competed in uh, FIRST Robotics teams for their schools. Um, and I think it's a it's a great program. And, you know, it really is, you know, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of kids, you know, talking to other teams, like learning from, you know, their experience with their robots, helping each other out um, you know when I ran cross country in high school uh, I had the honor of finishing dead last in a race once uh, and the great thing about finishing last in a race is that everybody's cheering for you um, you know the, your rival high school 
there, there are teams out there like cheering you on. Um, and I think that's a, a great example. And, you know, it's one of the great things about open source is like when we're, even when we're competing, like we're not really, you know, we're not, we're not really like angry at each other. Usually um, we're, we're all trying to make uh, everyone successful. We're trying to make the world a better place. Um, remembering to hit uh, unmute this time. Um, <laughs> Lee's asked, are there any uh, key funders for open source? I don't know if that's within the sort of topic here. You might have some thoughts on that. If, um, and maybe, maybe to tune it a little bit for this talk, um, are you aware of how competing projects uh, might be working, to, theoretically competing projects, might be working together to find funding opportunities, sponsorships, um, commercial partnerships, and so on? Yeah. Um, so I, to answer the more general question, a friend of mine has a hot take that I've been trying to get him to turn into a conference talk that uh, you know, basically says, all open source contribution is corporate funded, um, whether it's directly or indirectly, um, because you know for the most part people have uh, you know the time and the resources to contribute to open source because they're well paid in the tech industry. Um, clearly, not entirely true, but as a you know good first pass, it's um, I think it's a pretty reasonable, if not provocative, statement. Um, to answer the, the question more specifically, you know, I think funding open source projects is one of the harder problems we need to solve. Um, we've learned this time and time again with, um, you know, the Heartbleed bug, Log4j, like oh, there's all these, you know, major vulnerabilities that rest on the back of, you know, two or three person uh, teams developing an open source project and, you know, billions, if not trillions of dollars of economic activity rest upon it. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, a, uh, organizations like the Software Freedom Conservancy that provide sort of a fiscal sponsorship to an open source project. So you can just go to them and say, hey, please be the, you know, money handling arm for us. And they can do that. Um, I think the hard part for like, getting, you know, corporate funding and things like that is there are a lot of projects out there and a small amount of corporate dollars being spent on them. And, you know, especially um, in, you know, current interest rate conditions, like you have to, uh, you know, you have to make a solid case for it. So I think that's an opportunity where projects can come together and say, hey, you know, we're trying to do this thing. And again, going back to the economies of scale I talked about, like we're gonna run a conference devoted entirely to um, you know, content management systems. And so you might have three or four content management system projects that come together to run one event um, and then it becomes much bigger and much more impactful. And so then that's a way to you know, increase your chances of being able to receive um, funding for that. One thing that I've seen is that companies are very are a lot more willing to sponsor a tangible thing, whether that's a conference or donate some, you know, cloud computing credits or whatever, than they are to provide, you know, like here's some money, go spend it on what your project needs. Uh, I wish there was more of that, uh, but that's not what happens typically. Do you find? Um... But there's specific areas. So you mentioned conferences, and um, as an example, are there are there specific areas where, and maybe it changes over the time of the relationship between the partnering organizations. But specific parts is the technology an area that's readily understood, and therefore it seems like there's clear activities that can be done together, versus um, operational, you know, um, activity or strategic. Um, activities, how to build community and raise awareness and um, increase adoption. Um, you, you know, are there, are there, I mean, it could be anything, but are, what, what are your thoughts on how to engage in different aspects of projects? Um, I, the reason I bring it up is, is we have, most of our projects are primarily on in education. So there's a one layer 
of where collaboration might occur. Um, but then there's the technology that supports the tools, and that's another layer that might. And then there's the projects themselves that need um, sort of operational strategic support. So they're all a little different. The players might be a little different. Any thoughts on how to recognize which your organization is most needy in or best at or, or you know, how to manage that and identify areas of opportunity? Yeah, I think, you know, open source projects in general tend to be very software development driven. Um, you know, it's primarily about writing code and, you know, producing and shipping that code. Um, and so those kinds of, you know, areas, you know, maybe not the projects typically aren't going to cooperate a lot on like developing their own code. Like there's, you, you join the community and you, you can be in both, but it's not really something where project A and project B are, um, you know, cooperating as, you know, project wide things on the actual, like the, the end state of code. Um, but that's, you know, really easy to identify like, Hey, let's work together on build tooling or testing tooling or upstream libraries. Um, and I think that's where a lot of projects start because it's mostly developers and that's what they know. And that's like, that's where they're going to. And that's like the problem that's to the forefront of their minds. Um, I think it's probably more important, but less easy. Um, and this ties into uh, the question in chat from Lizo, how do you recruit non geeks to open source projects to handle clerical administrative PR issues, tasks, things like that. Um, that's the area where projects most benefit from that kind of collaboration in general, because that's not the skills that they have. Um, I think, you know, finding a uh, community that does that well and learning from them, either just going like, hey, how do you handle your issue triage? Because we're really bad at it. And like, can you just, you know, give us a 20 minute overview of what you do? Um, or it could be like, hey, you've got a really awesome bug triage team. Could we do something that would, you know, convince them to come help us with our bug triage too? Um, I think a lot of times in open source communities, because they're development centric, they don't always know that they need marketing help or that they need web design help or even UI design help. Um, I don't know how you come to realize that you need that help with, until you realize it. Um, I think, um, you know, if you recognize another project that's doing it well and go to them and ask for help, then you can, but again, like you have to know that you need that. Um, <clears throat> as for, you know, how do you recruit people to the projects? Um, one of the things is like, you got to keep the barrier to entry low. Um, you know, in Fedora, all of our documentation primarily is in uh, Antora, which is like a very nice documentation processor. It's all stored in Git repos. It's great for, you know, tracking versions and you know, doing all the cool things that you would do, just like you do with source code. A lot of technical writers don't know how to use Git. And when the, you know, first step to, hey, help us with our documentation is, okay, learn Git. Um, they just, they go away. Um, we've tried different things to try and, um, you know, reduce that. Uh, I think my Git for documentation writers is probably one of the best things I've written for Fedora uh, in my many years there. Uh, but again, like it's still, like it's a barrier to entry. I think also a lot of times people just don't even know that they, like they're using this open source software, but they don't know that they can contribute. Um, so, you know, you say, Hey, here's a list of things that we need. We would love for somebody to design our new logo. We don't have a logo or it's an old crappy logo that we did real quick on the back of a napkin. And we'd like one that looks nice. Um, you know, we would like somebody to help with our social media, like have specific tasks of, we wish somebody would help with us, help with that. And then people can see like, Oh, I will, I can do that. I'll help. Um, because people a lot of times, especially if they're not already in the open source community, don't know that that's a thing that they can do. Um, 
if you're talking to you know end user communities talk to them about how they can contribute not just like you know here's how you use our software but also hey if there's something their software isn't doing that you think it should do here's how you can you know submit a feature request here's how you can help us promote it to you know to your graduate students to your you know peers at other institutions um, give them a list of things that they could possibly do and let them pick from it I guess uh, so we just got a few more <laughs> another question but maybe we'll um um it's the top of the hour and i just uh maybe uh she can reach out directly email or something like that um to get into contact with more questions uh, i just want to respect everyone's hour and um also ben thank you very much for the presentation and the thoughts and ideas um i love the ambassador uh, maybe the the first thing is the uh, the first volunteer activity is to get a volunteer to manage the volunteer activities. <laughs> so <that's laughs> thing. Um, uh, but no, thank you very much for this. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, it was great. Um, and thank you for the offer on the, on the book uh, discount. Um, and if you're okay with it, we'll share it with the broader area community. Uh, Absolutely. Case, uh, they would also like to participate. Um, any last thoughts or anything else? Um, uh, before we sign off, no, um, I you know appreciate everyone's time and the great questions. I wish we had more time to answer them, but you know please get in touch with me. Um, I'd be happy to you know answer them directly via email or turn them into blog posts or whatever. So um, you know, thank you again for having me here today. Great, thanks so much, Ben.